much and uh, thank you for inviting both of us. Um, I want to tell you a bit about Adina because I feel that she, she won't tell you all and there's something you need to know. So this is Adina's cookbook, Sababa. It's uh, published in the US in English. And you know, I have been writing cookbooks, mostly Israeli cookbooks for many years. I think I wrote at least a dozen. Sababa is the best Israeli cookbook ever written. And it's surprising because Adina was born in Palo Alto, grew up in Palo Alto, then moved to New York. And then only then followed her heart and made Aliyah to Israel. Now she's ours, she's married in Israel and she lives almost in the Carmel market. And believe you me, six months from the day she arrived in Israel, she knew about Israeli food way more than I do. And she's the expert. And Sababa is simply the best ever Israeli cookbook. I admire it. So when, when Arya said that we would do a program about Israeli food, etc., I knew that, that uh, you guys must meet Adina because I think that Adina is a bridge between American food and Israeli food. Her three cookbooks with, uh, two cookbooks with Chrissy Teigen hit the, you know, the best-selling list uh, of the New York Times. And now she's writing a third one with Chrissy Teigen. So there's a lot to talk about. Shalom, Adina. Now you can tell lies about myself and then we'll see. I can, thank you, Gil, for uh, your lies. I appreciate <laughs> them very much. Um, I just want to say it's so nice to be here and to be on the same time zone. I am in LA right now and I did so many Zooms during COVID and I got so used to doing Zooms at 9 p.m. midnight, sometimes two in the morning. So Gil, thank you for, for tuning in at 8 p.m. And it's so nice to be here at brunch time. I just had my coffee and um, Gil, I met Gil uh, more than 20 years ago. I lived in Israel for five years after college and I worked at a TV station called Tel Ad, which was Israel's first commercial TV station, one of, uh, one of the broadcasters. And actually right after I left is when Gil's first TV program appeared on the network and was a huge smash hit. And I was already living back in New York, but the producer who was my mentor and who produced Gil's show connected us. And for some crazy reason, Gil took me under his wing because he knew I was passionate about Israeli food and trying to make a career change. And he has been one of my best friends, mentors, inspirations, and like family uh, ever since. And for some reason, he still holds on to me and I am always grateful. And um, I've learned so much from Gil and um, you'll see that he has a dedication in my book um, in the back because he's such an important part of my life. And we just love eating together, uh, hanging out together, talking about Israel and guilt just teaches me all those nuances of Israeli culture that as an outsider in a culinary culture, really just give me so much context and, and insight into what's going on in Israel and history. Gil is also not only an amazing writer, but a student of history. So I thank you, Gil, for everything that you've done for me. And it's a, really an honor to be here talking to you today. Ah, cool. So <laughs> I'll start with a question. It, well, actually, it's something that you told me. I think it's after you wrote the second Chrissy Teigen book. You said, Gili, you know, only now when I live in Israel, I see that American food and Israeli food are so, so, so different. Yes. What are the differences? What are the striking differences that surprised you? People ask to see Sababa again. So here is Sababa. There, Thank I'm you. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, one of the things that I learned about... Um, Israeli food when I first lived in Israel in the 1990s in Jerusalem was that seasonal market cooking wasn't sort of a, a modern trend. It was something that Israelis had been doing since Israel, modern Israel existed and long before. Israel is a, a market-based culture and going to the shuk is both a prosaic 
quotidian event and also a cultural and social event that revolves around the Jewish holidays and the Sabbath schedule. Markets are closed on the Sabbath. And, you know, being such a small country, Israel really revolves around its markets. And, you know, in the United States, um, this whole idea of seasonal cooking and market centric cooking is kind of new. You know, Alice Waters in the 1970s and 80s kind of introduced it. And we've sort of been slowly picking up speed, but you know, to Israelis, it's a way of life. And I think that is a huge, huge difference between the culture, something that is changing the United States. But, you know, I can speak for myself that I've lived in Israel now for six years. And because I live so close to the Shuk, I, I truly have never been inside of a major supermarket, not yeah. out of snobbery, but just because everything I need is right there. And I love the vibrancy and the checking in with uh, what's going on. And I see my Shuk friends and I get a pulse on what holiday is happening. Um, it's just really uh, an exciting uh, you know, difference. And I think the two cultures are coming closer together as, as the United States becomes more like that. I would say sort of like in Italy, you know, the southern part of Italy is called like the olive oil line. And then you reach what's called the butter line where you go up to, uh, you know, um, Bologna in the north, it becomes butter and cream. And I would say that American cooking still has, you know, a heavier feel. If you think about classic American dishes, a little bit richer, um, if you don't keep kosher, there's bacon and, you know, there's cheese and cream and heaviness. And I do think that Israeli cuisine is just so vegetable focused, again, going back to that seasonality and also really focused around the immigrant cultures, you know, that have populated Israel and made it what it is today. Like it's all come together in this incredible mishmash and, um, you know, it's true that pizza is an Italian food, but people rarely talk about the origins of pizza in the United States and who brought it to the United States and who's making it and what, you know, in Israel, you know, a, a plate of uh, Yemenite soup with schug can be a five hour discussion about how you make the schug, which part of Yemen did the people come from? How long has the family been making it? You know, now the children, you know, so it, it's it's that intimacy, I think, that, that being a small country filled with immigrants and, and different cultures really can lend to the food culture. I also think that it's not only this, it, it helps that you're crazy. And I want to tell our friends from Orange County that Adina is definitely crazy. And if we need any proof to this, she's an honorary Yemenite. So look <laughs> at this girl, a good Jewish girl from Palo Alto, decided <laughs> that she wants to become a Yemenite woman and she spent time in, in, in Rosh Ha'ayin, which is like the Yemenite town of Israel. And I'm half Yemenite. She knows all the secrets about Yemenite food that I never got to hear from my aunts. But again, you can, you can immerse yourself in a totally strange cuisine in Israel and learn it and be a part of it. And people are so open. I mean... I can't tell you the number of times, you know, people say, you know, you should come over and I'll, I'll teach you how to make. And I'll say, if you ask me again, I'm actually going to come. So I'm just warning you. And they <laughs> do, and they have me over and, you know, it's this incredibly immersive family experience um, that is so joyous and so heart filling for me. And, you know, as, as a Jewish person living in Israel, it's also enabled me to cook with Druze people and uh, Bedouins and Christians and all kinds of other people that also live in Israel. So, you know, food really is to me the through line through Israeli culture that can unite us all, that can break down barriers and obviously nourish us in a lot of different ways. So, yeah, I'm all I remember just before you left to the States, this time Adina wanted me to come with her to an Ethiopian restaurant because she wanted to, to learn some Ethiopian. Uh, recipes from the owner and since I'm sort of the minor celebrity here Adina said well you'll do the introduction and the minute Adina even suggested the idea that the owner of the restaurant would teach her recipes this fine young lady said yes come over come over it'll be okay come to my house come to this come to that so yeah people are proud of their cuisine in Israel sort yeah, of yeah I think I think it's a way for people to, um, you know, project their, their origins and their, their culture. Um, 
and Israel is a culture of entertaining. I always talk and I think another difference between the United States and Israel. One thing I really learned uh, after moving to Israel this time to um, marry my husband, Jay, um, which was the reason I went. I say I moved to Israel. It wasn't me? <laughs> well, kind of, because I say I moved to Israel for love, but I stayed for the shook. So, <laughs> um, and it's, a culture of entertaining, but it teaches you to relax a little bit. You know, I, I, I lived in New York for 20 years and I felt like spontaneity was scheduled two weeks in advance in 15 minute increments. Like there was no such thing as people just kind of stopping by, you know, and, it, and you know, I always felt, you know, in America we're raised, the house has to be, you know, spick and span, everything has to be just so. And I have really learned that the idea of entertaining is, is about also the host being relaxed and being able to enjoy just having people stop by. And it's really changed the way that I entertain. I keep a few salatim in the fridge. I have like a nice crusty loaf of bread and of course, cold wine for Gil, no matter what time of day it is. Or a martini. Talking about spontaneity, you always have to, 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 to bear it in mind that Gilly might drop to a morning martini. Might? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, so so that, that idea of entertaining is really integral to culture in Israel and in a spontaneous and casual way. And it, it, it loosens up the cooking process and the way you think about cooking. And, you know, it doesn't have to be such a production. It can just be some food between friends, which is something that I really, really love. Um, I want to mention another mutual friend of ours, Michael Salomonov uh, from Zaha, yes. from the restaurant in Philadelphia. The first time Adina took me over uh, to introduce me to Michael and we had a lovely dinner at Zahav, Michael was hysterical about the hummus. Like an Israeli guy, an Israeli restaurant critic is coming to a restaurant and he was hysterical. But was the hummus good? Was the hummus good? <laughs> Just, I talked to Mike like a week ago and I told him, why were you so hysterical about the hummus? He said, because this is what counts between Israeli men Hummus is what counts. Um, I wanted to ask you, talking about hummus, hummus was very political and the writing Sababa and being the nice person that you are, you try to include some Arab recipes in the book and what happened? Um, within Israel, it was a truly joyous experience. Um, I was welcomed into people's homes to cook their food. And, um, you know, I typically steer clear of politics when I'm cooking with people. Um, I obviously have my personal opinions about things, um, but I really don't like to uh, season my, my, my food with politics necessarily. And when I wrote Sababa, I, I really, uh, I realized that the arguments about the origins of food like falafel and hummus, it kind of exhausted me and they felt like conversation stoppers as opposed to conversation starters to me. I feel like if we spend all of our time arguing about where hummus or falafel or shawarma come from, we don't get to go deeper on the things that really matter like family and um, and connecting. And so I did try really hard in Sababa um, and I did catch some flack for it actually for mentioning Palestinians and Palestinian food and the origins of some of the ingredients that are now considered Israeli. And I just, I, my view on what we now consider cultural appropriation is just, if it, it doesn't have to be a charged conversation. If you say that Zatar is a Palestinian ingredient in its origins, you kind of diffuse the argument and the tension, and then you can go on and have a bigger discussion. And it's been a really interesting process for me, um, getting a lot of messages on Instagram and emails, um, some suggesting that I uh, steal, you know, food from other cultures. And as opposed to arguing, I always try to engage and understand where people are coming from. And I find that typically I can convert someone into someone who's willing to have a conversation as opposed to an argument. And I feel that that is a huge blessing that Sababa has brought me. And it's actually brought me closer to other cultures and obviously to other foods that I love and that I feel uh, happy to celebrate and acknowledge. So it's really an interesting process. It's ongoing. You have to develop a thick skin, Gil, as I'm sure you know, being a public figure, which is something relatively new for me because I spent the better part of a decade co-authoring books for other people. 
And I was always able to sort of stand behind their platform and write in their voice and help them shape their vision, their recipes and their food and their uh, pros. And to come out with Sababa, come out there with my own platform and ideas. And, uh, you know, it was definitely something I was convinced until the second Sababa came out that the book just sucked. So <laughs> what do you know? Come on. <laughs> It's been an interesting process and thank you for asking. And actually in the second, I'm writing a, the follow-up to Sababa, which is called Shabbat. And it's going to be all about how Israelis cook on weekends. It's going to be a combination of my style of entertaining food, um, which is a lot of platters and salads and room temperature things that are easy to make and, um, and, and those traditional dishes um, from all of the different ethnicities in Israel that we call like pot dishes, sirim, things that cook overnight. Um, and I am, when I get back to Israel, I'm going to cook with a Druze chef, female chef named Naifa Mula, who most recently was the chef of a culinary incubator in Tel Aviv and also a competitor on an Israeli uh, food competition show. And I'm really excited about Shabbat because not only is it going to allow me to learn dishes, but I'm hoping that I'm going to be in situ with people as they celebrate the weekend in Israel, regardless of how they do that. And I think it'll give me even deeper understanding of Israeli culture, um, which as a new immigrant is something that I always am craving and can sometimes be a little hard to access. So I feel really fortunate that food is this ticket in for me. Going back to Zahav and Michael Salomonov, so we yeah. know that Israeli food is having a minute right now or an hour in, <laughs> in America. What is your view of Israeli restaurants in the U.S.? Are they Israeli or are they American? Or are they different than Israeli restaurants in, uh, um, in Israel? That's a good question. I mean, I think that there are quote-unquote modern Israeli restaurants and there are traditional places that serve hummus and falafel and shawarma. Um, a lot of the kosher places in the States are more traditional and think serve like Yemenite food and falafel and shawarma and, and you can do it really well. The more experimental restaurants like Zahav, like Balabusta, like Bavel in LA, like Alon Shaya's restaurants in New Orleans are a little bit more boundary pushing, um, sometimes serve meat and dairy together. So they, they sort of blur the kosher lines. Um, and, you know, as chefs, they take liberties with techniques and, and fusion, which used to, for a while was kind of a dirty word in cooking, like fusion was big in the 80s and 90s, and then it kind of went away for a while, as um, I think this is part of what happened in Israel, too. You know, people ask, like, how did this Israeli food movement happen? You know, people say it was a moment. Now I say it's a movement because, you know, Five years ago, the idea that you could find a shakshuka kit in Trader Joe's was is mind blowing to me. Now I really think and you can. Like, yes, there's <laughs> shakshuka, there's schug in the refrigerator case. You can get bamba at Trader Joe's, which is the puffed peanut snack that children eat in Israel. And there are no peanut allergies in Israel, by the way, for children. Um, I'm convinced that Domino's is going to come out with like a shakshuka pizza like any day now. I think we've you know we've come that far, and you know. In the 80s and 90s, Gil, you can even speak to this better than I can, like the mark of a great chef in Israel was someone who could cook French food, Italian food, or continental food really well. And, you know, I think it was Israel still trying to puff its chest out and say, we're global, we're international, we can, you know, we can compete with the best, we're, we're sophisticated. And then the internet happened and young is, and Israel became a wealthier country and the world opened up and young people started traveling all over the world and chefs started moving all over the place and working in Michelin star restaurants all over the world. And what they were seeing at Michelle Bra's restaurant or at Danielle in New York was, was chefs trying to cook seasonal local food, take the, the best things that they had right under their noses and just elevate and glorify them. And I think the Israeli chefs all of a sudden started saying, hey, wait a minute, we have the best olive oils in the world. We have amazing cheeses. We have amazing wines. We have the best produce in the world. So why are we trying to cook someone else's food? Like, let's go back and celebrate and take our own food and push it forward a little bit with all these things we've been learning by traveling and watching food television and reading international cookbooks. So I think that that's kind of how Israeli food has sort of moved forward. And I think that 
most of these chefs in America who are exploring Israeli food have some Israeli heritage, like Michael Solomonov, Alon Shaya are, are Israeli born, but live in the United States. Einad Admoni is Israeli. Weirdly of the group of cookbook authors, I'm the only one who is not Israeli, but I'm the only one who's living in Israel. <laughs> so it's- an And the only one who's Yemenite. Ah, Emil, thank you. Thanks to you, Gil. Thanks to you. <laughs> uh, when you see, uh, I'll tell you in a minute what I see, but when you see was, Americans yeah. coming to, to Israel, what are the mistakes that they do with food? What are the misconceptions that uh, mostly Jewish Americans have when they come to Israel? Um, I think an interesting misconception is, you know, it's very hard to find, you know, it's very hard to find a bowl of matzo ball soup in Israel, for instance, at a restaurant or a corned beef sandwich or even a bagel or, you know, all those foods. Or that, knishes. Or Israelis knishes. don't know what knishes are. Or gribbenas and chopped liver, all those things that Americans and even non-Jewish Americans identify as, as Jewish food. Israelis also identify them as Jewish food, but not Israeli food. So what's interesting now is, you know, I think the last three to four decades have been about, you know, celebrating Mizrahi and North African culture and giving it its rightful place in the Israeli cooking canon and in culture in general. You know, you, uh, Mizrahi used to be considered second class citizens and there was a lot of talk about racism in Israel. And I think food has come a long way along with music and culture to sort of, um, level the playing field. Now I'm kind of waiting for that young Russian chef who was maybe born in Israel, but whose parents came from Russia or a Ukrainian. There are more than you know a million people in Israel from the former Soviet Union, but their food has remained separate. It hasn't really bled into the Israeli food scene yet. And I think also you're gonna start seeing a revival in Ashkenazi food and the way it maybe plays into the culture. You know, I think Ashkenazi food had a lot of associations with the Holocaust. It was food we wanted to leave behind from the old country and we were moving to a new Israel, fresh, sunny produce. And, you know, these foods were heavy and kind of sad to Israelis in a way. And if you go to a restaurant like Shmuley Cohen in Tel Aviv, it does feel like a relic of another time. But mm. I do see young Israelis now eating cholent on Fridays and, and, and exploring chopped liver. And I think we're gonna start seeing those foods kind of come into their own and take their place and have their moment in the sun. So it's more, it's more just like an understanding of how these foods fit into Israeli food history and mistakes um, that people make when they move to Israel. I would say, assuming that, you know, Israeli food is just, you know, falafel shawarma and schnitzel. Although on the other hand, another mistake is ignoring those foods because those are some of the best foods in Israel. You know, there are, there are so many classic restaurants that are making incredible things. Um, and if they make them well, one of the things I love about Israeli classic places is that they often just do one thing and do it really well. You don't need to have a menu with 30 items. Like if you're the schnitzel expert, you make the perfect schnitzel sandwich. If you make falafel, you do that really well. And that's something that I think a lot of American restaurants could learn from. <laughs> um, what do you think? I, I, so I, I think I think that um, it, it always puts me into stress when I see Americans looking for Ashkenazi food in Israel because yeah. it, it is no longer here. It, it's just, and it's not something that we're very good at as well. We, we may be longing for it, but people it don't eat. Uh, gefilte fish or um, uh, matzo bowl soup, etc., etc., in Israel in restaurants, even even in Tel Aviv, not not to mention Jerusalem. And it's not only because of the Mizrahi Jews. I think it's also because we're becoming more and more Arab. I mean, Israel is in the Middle East. Yeah. This is where we belong. This is who we are. I would say the one exception is a uh, chamin or cholent. I think that whether you're Ashkenazi or Sephardic you know, in come December, January in Israel, Instagram is filled only on Fridays with everybody's pot of cholent. And I think that there's something that has remained- But, but cholent is not necessarily Ashkenazi, you know, no, you, have, you have the North African cholent, etc. so- it, but, but a lot of people do make an Ashkenazi version. And I think it's the one food 
that ha you know you you still cannot get a decent deli sandwich in Israel, and it may be quite some time before you can, because people just may not be that interested. You know, it's also typically heavier food. Israel is a hot culture. Um, you know, people eat lighter in general. Maybe they eat one large meal a day, uh, filling up on vegetables and produce earlier in the day. Um, lots of drinks, liquids to hydrate you, fill you up. So there is, you know, a healthier vibe to Israeli cooking. And, you know, I didn't really think about whether Sababa was a vegetarian cookbook or a, a, a meat-based book. But when I, a lot of people ask me, you know, I'm vegetarian, should I buy your book? And I went through and counted and more than 70 of the recipes in the book were basically plant-based. So like, it just, without me even thinking about it really, you know. Yes, a, 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 an interesting fact is that Israel is one of the most vegan friendly countries in the world, yeah. especially Tel Aviv, of course. And people usually ask me why, because, you know, we're not that much concerned with, you know, the, 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 the wellness of the world. But I think that it's very easy to be vegan in Israel because everything is all is available and uh, except for tofu, maybe that our <laughs> tofu, tofu is not the best and we're proud of it. <laughs> I think it's easy to be vegan. I also have a theory that the most um, ardent vegans are secular Israelis. And I think that there's been, you know, in some parts of Israeli culture, there's a rejection of organized religion but Israelis are very obsessive and they found find other things to focus on, whether if they're not gonna be religious, they're gonna be religious about their veganism or their <laughs> triathlonism or their love of music or culture. So I think that, you know, they've channeled a lot of what our culture sort of is inchoate in us, you know, this fervency to, into, another, into another venue. And yes, I saw a question, is my book kosher? Yes, my book is kosher, proudly kosher, yes. Uh, so the, the Shabbat book is going to be uh, slightly heavier because Shabbat dishes are usually bigger and... Uh... It's going to be a mix. You know, I focused, I've already done four days of photography for the book, which I'm not really sure how I got that done during quarantine, but um, I focused on the more season, vegetable spring and summer dishes because that's what where we were. And, you know, unlike in the United States, a little sort of inside baseball about cookbooks, usually the way cookbooks work 99% of the time is that the writer develops all the recipes and then they gather a crew together and all the recipes are shot in like a 10 day or two week one time shoot. But truly in Israel, that is an impossibility because of the micro seasonality of foods. Like there are only berries like for a month of the year. And it's not like in the States where you can go to a supermarket and get a blackberry in the winter time. It just doesn't exist. So the way that I develop my books is I do re recipes based on the seasons, and then we have a photo shoot based on the season. And so we've done a lot of the really beautiful berries and corn and tomatoes and all that stuff. And when I get back to Israel next month, I am going to sort of drill down on those heavier dishes, like um, a lot of meat dishes for winter. But I'm also going to try and find uh, vegetarian dishes that are both authentic or my own spin on something that can still be hearty and filling in the winter time um, and fulfill the my main goal with the Shabbat book is you know I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home in Palo Alto um, where there were not a lot of kosher resources and my mother made everything desserts challah all of our soups everything from scratch and um, because she was observant you know once Shabbat started there was no more work like all the cooking was done and we just relaxed and like I'm trying to bring that vibe to my next book where you can do a lot of prep in advance and then what comes Shabbat time you can just sort of enjoy the fruits of your labor you know warm something up or toss all the elements together of a salad that you've already made or have salad team in the fridge breads that you've made so I'm, I'm gonna try and add a little bit of a self-care you know, uh, unplugging element without seeming like I'm jumping too much on sort of tr the trendy bandwagon. So, yeah. Let's talk a bit about guilt feelings because you were <laughs> mentioning, you, earlier you mentioned developing a recipe. <laughs> so, okay, you take a recipe and yes. you have an idea and you have your take on the recipe. Yes. Was there ever a recipe that you felt that you took too far from its origin or that you feel guilty about? Not necessarily in Sababa, 
in all of your work? I think earlier in my food career, I was trying to, you know, I, 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 I was feeling my oats, as we say, <laughs> and still trying to figure things out. And, you know, my personal journey of becoming not kosher at around the same time that I started working in food, like I tried to do some recipes that maybe put a spin on an Israeli dish with a non-kosher element. And it just, I kind of stopped doing it pretty quickly. Like I, I'm okay with pe not keeping kosher and there, the dishes in Sababa and my typical food style is kosher just because um, that's how I was raised. I don't, I, in my home is generally kosher style just because I don't keep, tend to keep pork or bacon in the home because I wasn't raised with them and I don't think to cook with them that often. But I think that what I've come to realize about Israeli food is that I'm really interested in honoring its traditions while moving it forward. And it just feels in some ways not doesn't feel like I'm doing anything wrong, but it doesn't feel authentic to me. I have no problem with other people doing it. I've seen a bacon wrapped matzo ball and all that kind of shtick, but like, it's just to me, it seems more, to me, it seems more uh, like a shtick than, than a true um, exploration. And so yeah. like, I'm interested in a deeper exploration. And to me, that has kind of taken me a little bit more back into a more traditional dietary lifestyle as well, which I'm really okay with. Um, before we get to a Q&A, we're nearing Thanksgiving, and I was wondering whether you think that there's any possibility of an Israeli Thanksgiving, because Turkey is so un-Israeli, so, so a whole Turkey. But, uh, uh, it, first, when I lived in Israel in the 90s, it was impossible to get a whole Turkey, or almost impossible. Turkey's in Israel are raised for their drumsticks. They raise them really big, and people buy the big drumsticks sometimes and cook it. Now that there are so many Americans living in Israel, you can order turkeys for Thanksgiving and actually uh, Meshek Barzilai, which, uh, sorry, um, Meshek Melamed, which is Israel's preeminent organic uh, poultry farm, which makes wonderful chickens, wrote me recently that would I help them promote the fact that they are now raising turkeys, organic turkeys, and they're going to try to market them to Israelis for thanks to American Israelis for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, if I were doing a Thanksgiving in Israel this year, um, I would go pretty traditional, but I might try and do fun things like make a stuffing that had like some Israeli spices in it um, for my turkey um or maybe a dessert that had an israeli spin um maybe i don't know i would do my cornbread and put some like hot israeli peppers in it i don't know but yes i think that you know because israel is a country of immigrants i think that americans are putting their own spins on the thanksgiving traditions there um and you know obviously using gil we both presented some recipes for this talk and all four of our recipes are orange <laughs> And yes. I think that, you know, the sort of fall like seasonal carrots, squash, pumpkin, all that kind of stuff, which, you know, in Israel, butternut squash is a year round thing. Like in the States, we really associate it with the fall. But in Israel, I see them all year. And, um, you know, and, and pumpkin also, like different kinds of pumpkin are not only in autumn, but at this time of year, I would probably go heavy on those kind of like orange seasonal autumnal vegetables. So we should mention again that, that uh, both of us, Adina and I sent uh, Arya by email recipes that, that are good for the Thanksgiving table. So you, I'm sure that Arya will email them to you or put them on your site or whatever. Before we go to a Q&A, I just wanted to mention, I see that Adina wants to say something. I just wanted to encourage you all to go buy Gil's book on Amazon, Candies from Heaven, before I forget. Yeah, um, sababa, sababa. No, 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 no. Gil, Gil is, in Israel, in, Gil is considered one of the finest writers in the country. Even when he was writing for newspapers, he was known for his elevated yet accessible style of writing. And he is a beautiful writer and his book was beautifully translated. And if you want to get to know Gil better, there is no way better than to buy his book um, on Amazon. I highly encourage you all to do so. It's a wonderful There book. is another way to, to get to know Gil better. Gil and Adina, Adina mm -hmm. and I 
are a commando team and we do the first ever Yemenite dinner in, in all sorts of cities around the world. The first one happened in Adina's tiny apartment on Central Park West in New York when we were living in New York. And then we did it in Berlin and uh, Arya, I think it's time we come to your community and we do a Yemenite dinner. You won't believe it. It's food that you've never tasted. It's not falafel and stuff like that. We cook fish soup in socks and all sorts of other stuff. And it, it's really, it's really cool. And, and the two uh, versions, you know, Gil, Gil makes Cubana bread uh, and I make Cubana bread and Gil's Cubana bread is uh, whole wheat and made with olive oil and it's incredibly delicious. And mine is like a super, Social, almost socially unacceptably rich version that I learned from the Yemenite ladies in Rosha Ain and even shocked Gil, who's the actual Yemenite. So, um, you know, we will make both and, and you guys can decide what, you know, what you like better. Well, this is great. Can I, can, can I, can I start the Q and A now? Cause there's so much Please to do. ask and so limited time. So, um, yes, Gil, I've offered, you mentioned this pop-up idea. I didn't know it was with Adina. So yeah, you're in. Beverly Jacobs is working on it. I got cool. Ron Morrison. Um, we're, we're ready to go. We'll, 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 when this Corona thing's gone, we'll do a pop up. Uh, we'll fly you in. We'll do something cool. Great. Okay. So here's the question for both of you: Best falafel outside of Israel and the Marais in Paris. Where can you find it in the states? Because I have not. I cannot eat falafel outside of those two places. This really disgusts me. So it's I need a place simple. in L.A. I need a it's, place in New York. Not homemade. I need like a restaurant place. So Michael Salamanov's falafel parlor in Philadelphia. The only problem is. He makes great falafel, really. It's, it's, an, it's amazing. The only problem is, and I told Michael, it's so clean. <laughs> you enter it and you feel uncomfortable. The place is clean. Falafel parlors in Israel, you, you know, it may be a garbage dump and it may be a falafel parlor. Fala uh, Michael's place is, is wonderful. It's great falafel in Philadelphia. Down How about there. LA? How about can, something close to Adina us, should know. Can... I'm... I'm I'm not. Oh, there's, a, there's a little um, place called Hasiba. Oh yeah. That has really great traditional-ish Israeli food, and there's a new place called Fala Bar, F-A-L-A -A Bar, um, that I think is it was supposed to open right before COVID and is is like a Postmates or Seamless only right now, but it's supposed to be pretty good. Um, and in New York, Taim Enada Moni's falafel is really excellent. Um, I also am sort of a, a fan of Mamoon's, which is like the old school falafel on, uh, in, uh, in Greenwich Village. But, you know, I think also check out the kosher restaurants in your city because those are often the places that are making falafel. And some of them do it quite well. Um, they might not be the trendiest or the coolest places, but they, they tend to do dishes like falafel quite well. And since I know that you all are great uh, travelers, I'll let you know that there is, I know a falafel place in Siberia. So <laughs> I was lecturing, I, I, when it's not COVID times, I'm lecturing a lot for the Israeli foreign office around the world or in universities around the world about Hebrew, about Israeli food, about my books, etc. And one day I was in Novosibirsk and, uh, you know, you, they give you a big car and they drive you around to show you the city. And suddenly I see this tiny Soviet hut with a sign saying falafel. I say, stop, I must taste this. Two Russian guys selling falafel in pita bread, falafel with mayo. Israel is never dreamed of falafel with mayo, but it was actually quite good. And it's the first falafel stand in Siberia. And I tell them, it's really good. Where did you get the recipe from? And they look at me like I'm an idiot. And he said, but of course, from Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Swiss falafel stand in Siberia. Try it. It's good. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that recommendation. The best falafel that I eat in Tel Aviv every day is in the Carmel Market. It's called Falafel Rambam or Elad is the guy who makes it. And he's Yemenite. And he put sauerkraut in his falafel because a neighbor of his mother's suggested it, who was Ashkenazi like 30, 40 years ago. And it actually works quite well because it balances the richness of the falafel. Just, just interesting. Uh, um, 
So let's move on to another. Okay, so let's talk about your book, Sababa, which is the, if, 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 if people are ordering the book right now, which apparently they are, people are doing it this minute from Thank our you. list. I can see them. Thank you. What, what's the first recipe they should make from the book? What's your recommendation? Um, I mean, I, I would start with the front of the book and make some of the staple condiments from different cultures that you can use in many, many different dishes, like a 24 hour uh, preserved lemon spread, the schug, which Gil taught me how to make. Um, Harissa. And then if, since we're sort of moving into fall, there's a recipe that went kind of viral from the book that sort of surprised me for a, a melt, I call it melted cabbage. And it's just wedges of cabbage that are uh, seared and braised in with uh, stock and a little wine and shallots and garlic, like really simple, so homey. And it's just, it's become kind of like a signature uh, dish from the book. It's so cheap to make and it's vegetarian and it's kind of a crowd pleaser. You can eat it as a main course with a little sour cream on it, and you know, or you can have it as a side dish with anything. And it's my daughter's favorite. <laughs> so, you, uh, so CSP, your challenge. I, I mean, I want to see pictures of you with um, you with one item that you've made from the book. Send me the send me the picture with you holding up the plate, and we will put it on our CSP website. Well, we're a very special place, and I'll send it to Gil Chovav, and you'll probably talk about it on national TV in Israel and show the picture. Is my guess. I don't of know course. that I can't guarantee. The first part I guarantee. So um, I'm not going to ask Gil this question because the answer is disappointing. I've heard it before. But Adina, you know, what do you cook at home? That that uh, what's your go-to meal? Because Gil, you, know, you think Gil would be this great chef, but I understand that's not quite the fact, right? Gil, you don't have anything that you Gil, cook at home. That... Gil is very humble. He makes right. incredible meals, of which I'm very gr uh, lucky to uh, to partake. Um, I tend to make. I like to make sort of one like large format thing, like a meat or a fish, and then like build around that with a lot of smaller dishes like salads or a grain or something. So like this time of year, I might do like a couple of like roast chickens that I've sort of um, been seasoning and let sit in the fridge for a day and then air chill and roast and then make, you know, some, some carrots and a beautiful salad to go with it and probably homemade trina or an eggplant salad. Like the salads are kind of always the thing that sort of like take the meal to the next level. Like Gil always puts out this amazing avocado salad um, that just like, I don't know how he does it, but the avocados feel like they were sort of like sliced fresh from some pristine tree in his backyard or something. Um, you know, and Gil always makes homemade um, barrecas or burrakitas or some kind of dough bound dumpling that are incredible. Um, so I try, I usually make my own challah, especially on weekends. Um, and also I'm somewhat known for making cocktails and I always like to have some kind of citrus juice that is that I juiced from things that I bought in the shook or like a simple syrup that I flavored with Middle Eastern spices or something that I have around and I'll always throw together a drink for people that sort of reflects the season or kind of what I'm cooking at that time. Wow. So when we come to Israel, finally, when, when this uh, pandemic goes away and uh, we can bring our hundred people or so to Israel, um, we'll just make sure to bring them by Gil's house or Adina, your place. Where do we come to enjoy food? Who, who said well, a place? Adina just remodeled. So you're okay. all invited to see her <laughs> new beautiful kitchen. Well, I do, you know, we do plan, you know, we have Gil on our list. I mean, we were supposed to go one of our options. We, uh, our trips to Israel are very unusual in that uh, people have multiple choices they choose from in advance. So when we're in Tel Aviv for part of the trip, there's four choices in the morning, four choices in the afternoon. One of the choices is a tour of Carmel Market with Gil, but uh, but maybe you know, you'll have to join us as well. So I want to talk about the markets for a second. My, my, I've been to Israel seven times. I lived in Israel for a year, and the only market I ever went to was uh, Machane Yehuda. It just shows you how limited my scope was <laughs> in, in, in Israel. But I've learned a lot more, and I've been to the Carmel Market. I haven't been there with Gil but I've been there with other people. So the question is to both of you, which is the best shuk in Israel and which is the most unknown, but a really cool shuk to check out that people may not know about? Because there's multiple, there's not just Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, there's other shuks around um, that people should know about. So I don't know who wants to take that. Adina, do you want to take that one? Maybe I, see mean, if I, I have with. my opinions, but everything I learned on the subject, I know from Gil. So I'm going to let Gil, Gil's taken me to many amazing markets. So I'm going to let him take this one. <laughs> I think the, the most beautiful market in Israel is definitely in Akko. It's a beautiful medieval 
Arab market and it's it's really like an oriental bazaar and it's quite big it's it's it spreads through the old city and it's special um, I think it's really cool the best market would be Mahane Yehuda it's the biggest it's the liveliest etc in Tel Aviv both Adina and I love the Carmel market because it's small and it's central and you get everything I think that the Levinsky market, the Levinsky spice market, sometimes is uh, skipped by tourists, but uh, it, it, it shouldn't be overlooked because it's a, it's a very special and different market. Yeah, the Levinsky, you know, it, it was originally uh, Balkan, Jews from the Balkans kind of started the market. And now the majority of, there's still some Greek and Bulgarian kind of cheese shops and things around, but the majority of it is spices. And many of the vendors both um, for spices and dried fruits and other products are Iraqi or- um, Persian. Persian. Um, yeah. But also I think the Tikva market is kind of the up and coming market because it's the most authentic and the least developed market in Tel Aviv. It's in the deep South in a very poor neighborhood. Um, it's a covered market and it has some real gems in there. Um, and there have been some attempts to open sort of modern restaurants in there. One of them lasted for about a year and didn't make it. But there are tour guides giving uh, tours of the Tikva market now. Um, it's kind of the market where, you know, Bibi Netanyahu goes to sort of prove that he's like a man of the people um, in the Tel Aviv area. So it has that vibe, a populist vibe very multi-ethnic, it's quite large. Um, it's comfortable to shop there because it's much wider than the Carmel market. Um, I love the Carmel uh, for its proximity to the Yemenite quarter and the influence of the Yemenite culture on the restaurants in the area. Um, and I also feel that while Mahane Huda is the most impressive, there's less and less food to buy there because there are so many restaurants and boutiques and, um, and bars and other things going on there. So it's a great place for visitors, but I think if you're a daily shopper that the Carmel can give the Mahane Huda market a run for its money. Mm -hmm. What, um, do you have a favorite um, personality in either any of those markets that you can <laughs> tell us about? I mean, how do you select among your, your, your uncles? I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, on the more traditional front, I would say that there is a gentleman named Edgar, um, who is an octogenarian from uh, Aleppo, Syria. And um, I, early on in my Shook journey, I noticed him because he only sold one thing. He sold, he would sell figs or strawberries or cherries or apricots or pomegranate seeds. And that's all he would sell. And I, uh, I like him because his produce is expensive, but there's none of that going to the bottom of the basket and finding the five rotten strawberries. You know, every... Are we stuck? Um, I think Adina yeah, is stuck. stuck. Oh, ah, she's back. back. I'm sorry. You're, you're, for talking, you're talking to us about rotten strawberries and then you stuck. Oh yeah, well anyway, Edgar only sells one thing and I, I told him that his produce looks like jewels and he told me that that, that was very uh, funny because he left um, his family business to work in the Diamond District for several years before he came back to the Shook and decided to just sell one thing. So he's a favorite. Um, and then my coffee shop, Tamati, which is a more modern um, addition to the Shook, has been open for a couple of years. Gil and I both drink coffee there. It has wonderful coffee, an amazing personality. Mickey, a young guy, super cool, Yemenite guy who just makes the best coffee and is the best host. So those are those are two of my favorites and I'm sure Gil has his as well. My favorite is Musi, the fishmonger, <laughs> is about the, the, the rudest person in the market. The meanest. But, but, but what I have, well, it, in, actually in Hebrew, when you say a fishmonger, it means somebody very uneducated and he is. <laughs> but he is so sweet and he wants to show, first of all, he wants to show everyone that he doesn't have any issue with, with gay stuff or problem with gay people. So whenever I come, he <laughs> kisses me and he hugs me and he says, Gilly, remember what we did last night and this and that. And then he brings the bottle of, of, of liquor that he has uh, in the 
fish fridge and I don't touch fish, I hate fish. But I go there every time to stand inside of all this stench just to have some free drinks. So he's Musi is good. And he's the pre premier supplier to all the top restaurants in Tel Aviv. Of, yes. He has the best fish in Tel Aviv. And his son has become a celebrity because he, was, he has a giant red afro and he was passed in an Israeli uh, cell phone commercial. And now he's like a celebrity wherever he goes. It's really and his daughters studied the um, uh, fashion and made clothes from skins of fish. And handbags, yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. Great. I mean, that's that. I think the fun of going to these markets with guides like you, um, you guys, is it's first of all to try foods we might not necessarily try. We'd be too scared, or we don't even know to try. But second is to meet these people, and and you know them. We don't know them. I will say that my friend Rabbi Charlie Savinor, um, I introduced him to Gil, and he was in Israel on a trip, and he called Gil, and and he said, "Can you show me and my family around the Machane Huda?" And Gil said, "Sure." And they went on a tour and Charlie said it was like traveling with royalty that every time, every store that they went to, people would come out and take pictures with him with because so, they said, Gil Chovav is here and with Charlie and, and he went to the restaurants and the whole staff came out. So, um, you know, on CSP, when we go on trips, we take people like Adina, if she's available and Gil and we go and we visit and we learn and we meet these people. Israelis are so proud of Gil because <laughs> he's proud of them and he, the love that he shows for every person in Israel, regardless of their economic status or their heritage, is truly beautiful. And I've been with Gil hundreds of times, and there's never a hand that he won't shake. There's never a grandmother's voicemail left on his home answering machine that he does not answer. He is a wonderful ambassador for Israeli food, both inside and outside of his country. So I even kiss fishmongers. <laughs> But in our, in our last few minutes, a, a final few questions. People have asked, and I've actually tried to look into it. Is there a place online, and maybe Adina, you know this answer from your United States connections or Gil maybe, um, where people can buy some of Israeli, the Israeli food products you know, online and yeah. get it now. Um, and I think spices would be easier to get than fresh produce, for example, but tell us what you know of that you could share. Um, so this, this is not a plug for my book, but I did a whole shopping guide in the back of the book. So you can, there's a section, a comprehensive list of online resources um, where you can purchase al almost anything that you need um, to make the recipes in Sababa. But, um, you know, places like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's are have more and more products. And again, I would encourage you like in Palo Alto where I go to visit my dad, the Persian supermarkets tend to have almost so many Israeli products and kosher products. And so Persian markets, Indian markets, Middle Eastern markets in general are just great places to find these products. And online, obviously anything is available on Amazon, um, but I have a list in the back of the book about what I think are the best brands and products to buy. And talking about uh, spices, we should mention La Boite in New York. Yes. It's one of the best spice stores in the, in the world and the Lior, the owner is Israeli, so it's always connected to Israel and it's great yeah. stuff. Spices are a real, you, there are several brands now. There's one called New York Shook that makes beautiful blends. There's also another one called Burlap and Barrel that is making, you know, sourcing spices, which is something that Lior from La Boite started is the new thing. It's like, it's not just like, oh, I'm making, I'm using paprika. It's where did the peppers come from? Who made them? Are they ethically sourced? So that's like an interesting trend going on in cooking in general is the sort of so knowing more about your spices. So that's a really good one, Gil. And then um, Ron Morrison wants to know, because he's the culinary person on our trip and here in Orange County as well. When we do come to Israel, and you know, things will change because I assume restaurants are having challenges and, and in America, good restaurants are closing and they may not open again. Um, but assuming re the restaurants don't change, which, um, which restaurants should, we, should he be going to? And, and um, enjoying food at in Tel Aviv or in Israel? Like what, what are the top one or two that you just can't miss either because of the food they serve or the particular chef in Israel? So I will give a few and then I'm sure Adina can add some more. In Jerusalem, one of my favorite restaurants is, and I'm not talking about fancy restaurants now, uh, right now, because Israel is all about, you know, 
truth and love and warmth. Um, so there is a place called Shamule. Shamule is like the little Shmuel, Shamule. And it's adjacent, it's Machane uh, Yehuda uh, adjacent. It's not in the market, but it's very near the market. And it's uh, Urfali food. Urfa is a region in Northeast Turkey. Um, and uh, it's a family that came from Urfa, Jewish, a, a Jewish family. And the guy uh, went through a very nasty divorce and his way to recover from his divorce was to open a tiny restaurant in which he cooks from 4 a.m. in the morning until 11 in the morning. And then the food is left on, on you know, very low flame until lunch begin, uh, lunchtime begins. And uh, this is what he serves and it's great, great, great food. So this is one thing. Another place is the place that I took Charlie Seven or two in the Machane Yehuda market in Jerusalem. Again, it's the only place in the world that I know that serves this pastry called Shamburak. Shamburak, you may hear the Hebrew in it, Shemevorach, blessed. It's the blessed leftovers of the Shabbat dinner, packed, chopped and packed in a pastry, baked in a tabun, in an oven, in a clay oven, and it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place. And it's it's street food. It's it's dirt cheap, of course. It's like I don't know, three dollars for lunch. And what's uh, the name of that? What is the name called? Shambur? The name of is the it? place is yeah. a very difficult name. It's called Ishtabach Shemo. It's oh, yeah, a right. pun in Hebrew. It's right. Ishtabach Shemo, praise the Lord. But Ishtabach Shemo in Hebrew, it's also a person who is a chef. Ishtabach Shemo. So, and it's in the market right across the street from the famous, famous, famous Machne Yuda restaurant, which is a lovely restaurant that everybody knows about, you know, all over the world. They opened branches in Paris and in London and here and there, but it's a very noisy restaurant. So, Ishtabach Shemo is, is, is more authentic. Adina? Yeah. Um, I endorse Ishtabach for sure in Jerusalem. Oh. We disappeared. Again. No. Shoot. Nah, now we see oh, sorry. You. Am I back? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I highly endorse um, Ishtabach. It's one of my favorites as well. Um, in Tel Aviv, I really like the Tel Aviv branch of Azura, which is a Jerusalem institution um, that makes incredible Kurdish and Mizrahi food. Um, the owner of the Tel Aviv branch is the son of the Jerusalem chef and he has moved to Tel Aviv and is making fabulous stuffed vegetables, salads, soups. It's a little fresher and less oily than the Jerusalem branch. Um, and it's a real chef hangout, which is fun, but um, that's not why I go. Um, I don't actually know some of the chefs in Tel Aviv, but the food is wonderful. And then in my neighborhood, I tend to eat a lot in the Shuka Carmel area just because I live there, so I go to M25, which is an Israeli steakhouse that makes a really good arayas, which is a sort of old dish that's new again, which is a lamb burger stuffed into a small pita that's doused in olive oil and grilled until the pita gets crisp and the burger inside gets really juicy. Um, and I also uh, really like uh, the Basta, which Gil does not like because it's almost all fish. <laughs> um, but it's a lovely uh, little uh, restaurant that's right off the shook. And there are so many others. And if any of you do come to Israel, please reach out to me. I'm happy to always give recommendations for where to eat and what to do and where to buy things in the shook and all that kind of stuff. So, Well, we're, you know, we're, we're out of time. So people have so many questions. If you don't mind, uh, if, if people email me the questions, I, maybe I'll email them to you to you both. And if you send me answers and I'll share it with the whole group, kind of like an FAQ Good idea. from Adina and Gil. What, someone asked what the name of that spice store was in New York. They didn't catch it. That La Boite, like the box in French. La Boite, the uh, spice atelier. L-A-B-O-I-T-E. And they have a website where you can order all of the spices. And also he makes biscuits with different spices that he makes that are lovely. And he has written several 
cookbooks. And the most recent one is called Mastering Spice. And it's all about how to use uh, spices in your cooking. And then my last question was, you mentioned something about Israeli food, I think in, in New Orleans, unless I got that wrong. Did I, did I misunderstand that? Or is there something going on no. that we should um, know about? No, Alon Shaya, who's um, an Israeli uh, American chef who worked for John Besh for many years and then rediscovered his Israeli roots or explored them as an adult, opened Shaya, um, which is in New Orleans and is considered one of the top restaurants in the country. Um, he had a falling out with um, John Besh and the group and they kept his name. So he, Shaya still exists and still very good, but his restaurants, his restaurant in uh, New Orleans is called um, Safta. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a new one. So um, what an awesome program. I know we have Sharon Keller on, Professor Sharon Keller, a CSP one month scholar, but she's also a cook and she cooks amazing foods. And so I am challenging her to take a picture of her with a dish from your um, uh, your recipe book from Sababa, as well as everybody else um, who wants to do it, send me a picture. Maybe you'll get something out of it um, from CSP. And Gil, tell us about this new book that you wrote before we go. Apparently during the <laughs> pandemic, you had nothing to do, so you wrote a new book. Yeah, I, I, I had to stay nine rooms locked up in my, uh, nine days locked up in my room because I came back from um, Austria, which was a red country, so... Uh, and so I wrote a book, a small book about the big world, about my travels around the world, and uh, it was very successful. I'm very proud. Even though stores are closed in Israel, we already printed the second edition. So Gil, COVID works. Gil loves quarantine. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I think quarantine is wonderful. I, I just love it. I could live like this to the end of time. He's a homebody, so he loves it. Well, what a great, what a great um, escape for all of us. I didn't know what to expect. I knew it would be good because I, I knew Gil would entertain. Adina, um, you are entertaining as well and so knowledgeable. And, um, you know, we look forward to uh, your next cookbook on Shabbat. Yeah. And um, we will all explore recipes in your current book. You know, I'm not a spice person, so I'll have to probably spice down some of the stuff. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I mean hot stuff. I'm not a hot spice person. But um, I look forward to trying some of these recipes. I wish everybody a great uh, Thanksgiving lead up and look at all these new recipes you can try. Stop baking bread, whatever you've been doing for eight months and um, <laughs> let's explore Israeli cuisine here um, in the United States. I'm looking forward to seeing your photos and uh, just again, thank you everybody. Wish you a great day uh, and uh, a great future for America and a uh, hopeful future for everybody. And for thank you us. very so, much. Take care, everybody. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. My mom and dad are on here somewhere. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Uh, hi, new people, if I, if I just met you. And uh, I think with the Rubens, you know, Rubens, CSP is the one that brought the, um, the chefs from Israel to the United States with Avi Margalit. So I guess we've been partnering with you all these years. Ahuva ho. Another program with Mizrahi food, Mizrahi reference. I hope you're keeping track. 134 programs, 120 have referenced Mizrahi and uh, Sephardim and um, the new world order, everybody. Come on. You got to try these recipes. Thank you, Adina. Good luck. Um, in Bye. LA. And then you trip back to Israel. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Lindy. Okay. Bye, guys.